when I was saved, it, it just was the most natural thing in the world for me to share my testimony and share with people what happened to me because I had such a dramatic conversion that it was like night and then day came. And I was now in the day and no more in the dark. And uh, I, I just, it was just natural to share Jesus when I went back to work. And that's what I've been doing all my life is sharing Jesus with whoever I come in contact with. But let's read this and uh, we'll get into the Word of God tonight. Everybody has their list. Lesson one, you want to realize that you have been engaged by the Master to do this kind of work. That your time is not your own. That every unsaved man is an opportunity. You are selling the greatest blessings and the price you are asking is their confession of the Lordship of Jesus and their acceptance of Him as their Savior. For every soul you win, you get stars in your crown. They, they get eternal life and blessings beyond words. Following are some suggestions. Never ask a man if he is saved. Well, I've done that. Never tell him he must repent. Well, I've done that. Never tell him he's going to go to hell. Well, I've done that. <laughs> but I don't do it as much as I used to. <laughs> Give him the word and he will repent. I definitely do that. <laughs> Be courteous. I do that. Be very kind. I do that. Be as wise as a serpent serpent. I try to do that. And as gentle as a dove, I try to do that. Get along with your, uh, your prospects if you can. Never argue. Well, I have done that a few times. <laughs> but I don't do that no more. Answer all questions from the word. Be firm but gentle. If he asks questions you cannot answer, a knowledge yet, never bluff, never show off. Say, you can relax in this thing. If you don't know, just say, well, listen, I'll do my best to get the answer for you and get back with you. Remember, you are dealing with eternal personalities. That person is eternal, and you are dealing with eternal issues. Win their confidence, and then win them with the word. Show them gently and tenderly that <coughs> because of Adam's sin in the garden, man died spiritually and he lost his standing with God. Genesis 2, 17. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Adam died spiritually and was driven from the garden the day that he partook of the forbidden fruit. His physical death took place some 930 years later. Romans 5, 12, death passed into all men. Since the time of Adam, every man accepts Christ, except Christ has been spiritually dead, and the evil that is in the world is an outcropping of the death that, that is in man's spirit. Spiritual Death shows itself more plainly in some people than others. Take the case of a criminal. <coughs> it is easy to see how he could be spiritually dead. But in the case of an honest, good living man, it is not manifested so openly. Yes, he too is spiritually dead. God's word declares it. In 1 Samuel 16, 7 explains this. The man looketh on the outward appearance, but Jehovah looketh on the heart. We see only a man's conduct, and a man may justify himself in the eyes of men by his good manner of life. Jehovah looks on the heart, or a man's spirit, and it is here that spiritual death is lodged. Knowing this, that every man outside of Christ is spiritually dead, we can see that Jesus Christ offers the only solution to man's need. In John 10.10, 10, he tells us that I am come that they might have life. This is eternal life, 
the nature and life of God that is imparted to man's spirit, making him the actual son of God, a new creature with a new nature. Following our scriptures showing how to receive eternal life. Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every man to his own way. And Jehovah has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Our redemption has been purchased and our penalty paid. It remains for us to accept it. John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become children of God, even to them that believe on his name. And Romans 10, 9, 10 tells how one may receive Christ and thus become a child of God. It reads that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth com confession is made unto salvation. This is why we have to confess the word. Uh, when we confess Christ as our Lord and Savior, and we believe in our heart, see, God looks at the heart, and God sees our heart, then he ministers salvation to us. And so confession is made unto salvation. You need to catch that phrase. Confession, when you confess the word, confession is made unto healing. Confession is made unto life. Confession is made unto salvation. Confession is made unto prosperity. What we confess with our mouth, you gotta remember that that's the bottom line. That's why we learn the word of the Lord and we confess the word of God because as we confess it, then if we confess that word of healing, God's Holy Spirit has the responsibility to make it real. Now, when you start confessing the word of God, regardless of what promise you're laying hold of, just remember when you plant your garden, you didn't have corn that evening. You planted that morning and it took, you know, maybe 60 days or 70 days for the little sprout and it had to grow. It had to, had to, it was in progress. Okay. So keep confessing and believing what you are believing for. Don't give up because you don't see it the next day. That's just not the way it works. It works as you continue to hold fast to your confession and our confession. I've been confessing, uh, uh, I went to the doctor, I think it was yesterday, and, and my report was real good on my prostates. And uh, I've had two operations on it and all of that. And I said, Lord, I don't want to go through that again. So every time I go to the bathroom, I say, thank you, Lord. By the stripes of Jesus, my prostates are healed. And I command the swelling to go down in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And I've been doing that. And I, I tell you what, I hadn't had any more trouble with it. In fact, it's better now than it was two years ago. So I've learned to just keep, just keep confessing, keep thanking God, keep praising God for your healing, for your salvation, for whatever you believe in for. Hold fast to your confession of faith. Uh, a lot of time when Susan and me pray, uh, we just simply come out, Lord, we thank you. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's our Lord and Savior. He's our Master. I thank you, Lord. You are everything to us. And we just pray a confession to the Lord. Lord, we thank you that by the stripes of Jesus we're healed. Lord, I'm 83, but what is that to you? I live and move and have my being, not because I'm 83. I have my being. I live and move and have my being because of God. He's the one that keeps me alive. Hello, are you out there? Amen. See, this is what you've got to settle in your mind. Confession is made unto what? Salvation. Confession is made unto what? Healing. Confession is made unto. So that's why many times when we witness to people, we want them to confess with thy mouth. Jesus said, if you acknowledge me before my heavenly father, I will acknowledge you. Or I'm sorry, 
if you will acknowledge me before man, I will acknowledge you before my heavenly Father. <coughs> so as we get people to speak, we do it in our everyday life. When, I, when Susan and me got married, you know, I had to say, yes, I do. We'd, been standing, we'd be standing there right now, 62 years, just standing there. No, we said, I do. Everybody said, amen. <laughs> amen. And her father said, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> Speak it. I love you, brother. Love you. I love you. What am I doing? I'm planting seeds. I love you, Willie. Love you, Linda. Love you. Love you. Love you. Love, 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 love. That's godly love. That's divine love. That, I'm not talking about carnal love here. Godly love. I love you. And let me tell you what it does to you. That's casting your, your bread out on the water and it's coming back to you. Whatever you plant, you get. See, it's so simple. It is not complicated. Even nature teaches us that. <clears throat> if I plant corn, I'm going to get corn. If I plant okra, I'm going to get okra. That's why the Bible says, overcome evil with good. If I try to overcome evil with evil, what am I going to get? Evil. evil. See, it works either way, positively or negatively. Always remember that. <coughs> so, watch what we say. Let me, let me share this a little bit about confession, then we'll move on a little bit further. Realization can only follow confession. We walk in the light of our testimony. The word becomes real only as we confess its reality. Let me say that again. The word becomes real to us only as we confess its reality. It's true. We understand that? It becomes real as we confess it. And it has everything to do with your physical makeup, your health, your strength. Susan and me have dealt with families over the years and dealt with children that, that when their father and mother don't speak the right words to them, man, you're killing your kid. You're killing your child with words. And people don't know the power. Yet yeah, the Bible says life and death is in the power of the foot. Huh? What? Tongue. Tongue, yeah. Yeah, life and death is in the power of the nose. No. Life and death. You either kill your child or you bring your child to life. Somebody say, ouch. Yeah. Now, we're learning. So... That's why we're a little easier on the grandchildren, aren't we? <laughs> Seriously, I, 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 start, I killed my first daughter. And I repented. I, have. I went to her and I asked her to forgive me. Because I didn't know how to raise kids. If you do that again, I'm going to knock your head off. Can you imagine your kid walking around the neighborhood, going to school with no head? What happened to your head? What did my daddy knock it off? That crushes. We kill each other by our words. We either bring life to ourselves and life to others by what we speak. And you will, you will have to, you will, and we're all learning that. How many is really learning that, what I just said? I know you know that, but I'm, sometimes we need to bring to our remembrance. So when we go out and, and, and there's times we, we want to say, God, use me to win that person to Christ, okay? The mouth is involved in accepting Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. Satan fears our testimony. If you confess something with your mouth, it reacts upon your heart or your spirit. We confess what we are in Christ. Then we act our confession. If we confess our fears, they will rule us. Make sure you got that. 
And you're going to, uh, you're going to, let me tell you something. You're going to sense fear sometimes. We're all natural. We're still in these natural bodies, but you don't go along with it. No, God's not giving me a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. So we're all going to experience fear at times because we're human beings and we're in these bodies. These bodies have not been redeemed yet and they're still subject to the laws of this, of this earth. So if you, if you feel scared, if you, if, you, if you sense fear, you don't just start going around and confess it all the time because what you're doing, you are establishing it in your psychic, in your brain, in your spirit. So you go opposite. Very simple. If you, if you feel rejected, you say, no, I'm accepted in the beloved. Who is the beloved? Jesus. Amen. I'm accepted in the beloved. See? Right, so remember, you've got to go opposite from what, uh, what you feel many times. Because the enemy, it talks about the fiery darts of the enemy. And he shoots those darts into your mind, into your spirit. And all of a sudden, you're experiencing it. And then you're confessing it and you're, you're, you are um, establishing it in your life. So you go, no, I refuse that fear. I refuse that anxiety. I refuse that. The Lord has blessed me. The Lord is my shield. My Lord is my, and we've been teaching that for years here at the shield. So remember that. Okay, now let's go. <clears throat> If we confess the dominion of disease, it asserts its lordship over our bodies more fully. If we confess our freedom that the Son has made us free, God makes that confession a reality. So remember this, when you are sharing your testimony with somebody, you want them to confess it. Okay? Remember that. Now, I want to show you something here. I need somebody to, uh, to, to would, you, would you volunteer? Thank you. Uh, that's wonderful. I, I appreciate him volunteer, don't you? Oh, give him a, come on, come on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, now here's a man on the street, you know. And uh, there's many ways you can approach people. If, you, if, if we're working together, probably in, the, in during the day as we work together, and I'm a Christian, let's say you're not a Christian, okay? And, uh, and I've been praying for you, okay? And, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, how am I going to... Do you know you're going to hell when you die, boy? <laughs> <laughs> that ain't going to get it, you know what I mean? But, but first you got to... I think you show... First you show your, your, your love by your testimony, by your life. And you've been watching me for a week, and let's say we've been working together. But then all of a sudden, the Lord brings us together, and there's nobody else around but him and me. And I said, you know, I've been praying for you. You know, I want you to know, I don't know, you may know this, but God loves you. And, um, you know, the Lord died on that cross for our sins. And what I would do, there's many ways you can do it, but I would say, you know, uh, one day I was in church, just like that, I saw the light and I gave my life to Christ and my life changed. Now I'm not talking about I'm perfect in every aspect of my life, but my life has changed because of Jesus Christ. But here's what God says. How do you become a Christian? A lot of people need to know that. Well, God makes it very clear in the Bible. And he said, if I will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thy shall be saved. You ever thought of it like that? That's right. You're a married man. Let's say you're married. Okay. Let's say you're married. Say, did you have to say anything when you got married? Well, I did. Yes. You did? You had to open your mouth, didn't you? I did. Okay. So, have you ever thought about receiving Christ as your Savior? Yes. How would you like to do it right now? Okay. All right. Now, I want you to say this, Lord, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I confess that I'm a sinner. And I need salvation. And I need salvation. Right now. Right now. I confess Christ. I confess Christ. As my Lord and Savior. As my Lord and Savior. And I believe in my heart. And I believe in my heart. 
but God raised him from the dead. Now God says you're saved. Welcome to the kingdom of God. Now that's as simple as that. God is the one that does the work inside. It ain't no big deal. Now the Bible says, if I will confess with your mouth, did he confess with his mouth? Yes. He said he believed in his heart. Yes. God says he's saved. Right. All right. Put that on the board now. Boy, the time going by fast. Thank God. Sir. Thank you so much, son. Now, I would share a little bit more with him uh, uh, about, you know, in his Christian life. But he try to help him along the way and everything. But put uh, Romans chapter 10 up there. Nine, start with verse nine. And the time's going fast. Man. All right, because if you acknowledge and confess with your lips or your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and in your heart believe and heave to trust and rely on the truth that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's it. That's what you call the gospel in a nutshell. Okay? Now just keep that up on the board. Now here's another gentleman. He's, he's volunteering. I'm in Walmart, and, we, and Susan B. does this all the time. All the time, wherever we go, as God leads us, we're constantly here. And I come up to him, and I, and I say, did you hear about the guy that had a week back? Uh, no. Yeah, this guy had a week back. He went to the doctor. Yeah. Yep. He said, Doc, I got a week back. Yeah. Yeah. And the doctor said, how long you had that week back? Mm, he said, oh, about a week back. A week back. Anyway, <laughs> do you know how to hide a camel in the desert? Nope. Well, I'm about to show you. Now, people are all going around, and you know, it doesn't matter, just him and me and the Lord. And I said, well, you know, it's very simple. It's not complicated, if I can get this thing over. You, you camouflage it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they do. They, they look at that. Oh, my God. <laughs> look at the other side. Well, when you get home, get on your computer, check me out. If you don't like what you hear, throw it away. But I tell you what, there's messages on your website. You can be saved. Now, I might leave it there, I say, but I'll say something like this. Now, in this little book is everything he needs to know to get saved. Right there. Yep. I said, well, have you had your vitamins today? Yep. Well, here's some eternal vitamins. You get a chance, you read that and give it some thought. Okay. God Thank bless you. you. I'm gone. All of a sudden, I'm with another person. Another person. All through Walmart. So simple, so complicated. See, if you keep the seeds in your pocket, you ain't gonna get no corn. You gotta sow the seed. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? You gotta sow the seed. See, sowing, sowing is all through the Bible. Sowing, the farmer sows. All right? You can, uh, Let's just put that away. You can finish reading that. I want you to turn now to Matthew 13. Matthew 13, chapter 13, verse 18. We want to talk about the sower. We have found, Susan and me have found, and I know many of you are doing this, and I really congratulate you for witnessing. And, and, but Susan and me are finding people so open, so open. Very few people reject. I go to the doctor, you can be sure that those people, those nurses, they're gonna, they're, gonna, they're, gonna, they're gonna get what I just showed you right there. Every one of them, I don't care who it is. And then I say, listen, do me a favor, when you see the doctor, give him this way. <laughs> Put the burden on him. See, there's so many ways you can spread the word of God. But you gotta sow. The garden will not come up, we gotta have sowers. Everybody say, I'm a sower. Okay. Start out simple, not complicated. You will be surprised how gracious people are. Okay, now, let's, let's read this. Here we go. Matthew 13, starting with verse 18. Listen then to the meaning of the parable of the sower. Now, Jesus starts out, of course, in, in this uh, parable of the sower. He talks about it. Nobody's understanding what... Uh, uh, he's saying, and so now he's going to interpret it, okay? And here he is, starting with eight, 18, he's interpreting. 
Look at verse 19, okay? While anyone is hearing the word of the kingdom and does not grasp and comprehend it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. That is what was sown along the roadside. Now, Jesus is explaining the parable. The sower comes and he's sowing the seed. Some of it falls on the roadside. All right, the devil comes and he steals it. This is why you need to hold the word of God in your mind, because I guarantee you the enemy will, what was that scripture now? You know, he'll steal it out of your heart. So certain scriptures, meditate on them, know them, memorize them, because the enemy will try to steal that word. Now remember, uh, Holy Spirit and the word together. All spirit you blow up, all word you dry up, spirit and word you'll grow up. Remember that. <clears throat> All right, next verse, 20. As for what was sown in thin rocky soil, this is he or the person who hears the word and at once welcomes and accepts it with joy. Now, we've all met people like that. Many of them will come down and say, I give my life to the Lord. You never see him again. Because the devil works and the world is influence of the world is so strong on them they have no root system and bingo next verse yet it has no real root in him talking about what we just read there in the other verse but is temporary in instant lasts is but a little while and when affliction or trouble or persecution comes on account of the word at once he is caused to stumble, he is repelled and begins to distrust and deserts him whom he ought to trust and obey, and he falls away. I guarantee you so many people, this is why uh, we try to get people to come to church where we can, can build into them confidence in the word of God, that their faith would grow and realize they must learn now to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Some people do not understand what they have to do. Now, th there are some people that, that when they accept Christ, they've been bruised. They've been bruised by their parents. They've been bruised by their, their friends. They've been bruised by the world. They bruised themselves by their own sins many times. And yes, they get salvation, but they need healing. They need deliverance. They need uh, people to love them back to life. Some people you just have to love back to life. They're so hurt and so wounded. And some of you know what I'm talking about. So there's different ways that we witness. There's different ways that we minister to people. And you just learn that as you walk in the Spirit, as you live in the Spirit yourself. And you, and you experience working with so many people, you will see the different people with different problems that they have, okay? All right. And, and those things you just, you just will, it, will, it will influence you how to love them and, and just be patient with them, okay? I remember this one guy, he called me up. He was a pastor. He said, you know, I worked with this guy three, three years and he got off of drugs. And the other day, you know, I saw him smoke a cigarette. What am I to do? Boy, that boy's making progress <laughs> from drugs to a cigarette. <laughs> that's bad, too. That'll burn your lungs out, too, believe me. But that's still progress. I said, well, what do you do when you sin? Well, I, I, I confess it. Well, share with the boy first one, first John 1, 9. It's simple, it's not complicated. God has made provisions. Learn what those provisions are and confess them and do what they say to do and get back on the road of holiness and keep walking with God. Is anybody in here since you've been a Christian saying, one person? <laughs> Let me say that again. It might do some of you good to confess it. Anybody in here since you've been a Christian have sinned? 
I see some of you not raising your hand. Are you hearing me? <laughs> well, what did you do? That's right. Is God faithful? Is God just? Yes. To do what? And cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. Get up shouting. And tell the devil go. And then keep on plowing, man. Keep on plowing. Oh, so I told him, uh, just tell him, just do what, t t tell him what you do and get him back on the road and, and get on with life. Don't make a big, you know, deal out of it. All right, let's get back to this. It's got 15 more minutes, I can't believe it. Anyway, verse, the next verse, 21 <clears throat> or 22. And for what was sown among thorns, this is he who hears the word, but the cares, boy, now this is a Lulu, the cares of the world and the pleasure and delight and glamorous and deceitfulness of riches chokes and suffocates the word and it yields no fruit. Well, you'll meet these type of people along the way and on the journey. You probably have them in your family. Uh, you might have backslid and then you realize it was the wanting to, this and wanting that. And if I don't get that, I won't, can't live. And, and we all start out that with, I did, you know. But then God has to deal with us and work in our hearts and get us to relax and, and let God bless us. I, I started out, I had three houses, I had a duplex I rented out, I had, uh, let's see, five, five acres of land and a house and another house, and, and, uh, and I was just, you know, that type of person that uh, deals, I see a deal and I could move and make money on it and one thing and another, but one day when God called me, I give it all up. And I ended up with about $68 in my bank account. And then God said, okay, now let's go to work, son. And so I just trusted him, and, and here I am today, blessed, blessed, blessed. Amen. Just walking with Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I could tell you so much on that, but I, the time element. All right, so suffocate the word. Look at that, and it yields no fruit. Now, let's be honest, let's bring it down where we live. You may be, or somebody in here, or somebody here in this DVD may, may uh, allow, notice, the pleasures of the world to suffocate the word. The pleasures to suffocate the word. You're in de deceitfulness of, of riches. Notice, deceitfulness of riches. Now, God expects us to work. God expects us to have nice things. He's not a party pooper. He's a, he's a God that multiplies. But there's one thing when God blesses you, and there's one thing you're just out trying to uh, bless yourself and, and just get all these riches, and the next thing you know, all your energy goes to that. You, you can understand that. So you have to finally come to a place. Yeah, God expects us to work. He expects us to... In fact, the Bible says work that you might have money to help others. I used to think, what? <laughs> I, I want to help myself. <laughs> have money to help others. <laughs> See, if you notice, God is always others. <laughs> See, when you get tied with, with Jesus, it's always others. But see, God will take care of you. God takes care of you. He takes care of his own. He knows his own. He'll take care of you. All right, let's finish that. Next verse. which is 23. And for what was sown on good soil, this is he who hears the word and grasps and comprehends it. This is why I like teaching better than preaching. I can preach. I can preach hell down. I can preach far down. But I want people to understand and comprehend what the word says. All right? And I, and I believe in preaching and I'll do some preaching. But... Look, hear the word and grasp and comprehend it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundred times as much as was sown, in another sixty times as much, and in another thirty. Now, 
What did I preach last Sunday? I don't know if I can remember myself. Who can remember? <laughs> Willie remembers. That's why when I, when I go home, I, look, I listen to the tape again. I say, wow, did I say that? Man, that's good, Bob. <laughs> So you get, we got tapes back there. They're piling up down there. Take them home. Go over them again and again. I mean, get involved in the Word of God. Everybody say, ouch. ouch. This is what you, and I tell you, the blessings will come. Your, your mind will become spiritual, and a lot of this other garbage, that's all it is. It's just all the things you see are going to pass away. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't take care of your house and things and have nice things, but you understand what I'm saying. My priority is God. My priority is the, is the priority. God, my family, and the church, and, and right on down. Filling my mind with the good things of God, because that's where the battle is, right in your mind. I guarantee you if, you, if one bad thing hits your mind and you think on it for eight hours, I will guarantee we'll scrape you off the floor. You'll go down, down, down. So what do you do? You make the Lord your refuge. When you have to believe God for thousands of dollars, you better have something in your heart. Because that's what we've had to do. What you see here. This land, this property, everything we have, the equipment we have, it takes faith, trusting God, but in a way that you're not worried about it. How many is worried about anything? You wouldn't tell me anyway, would you? <laughs> Let me look at your face, I can tell. <laughs> I ain't putting you down because I love you. I love, I, can, I used to just look at my kids. I can, I can tell you about my kids when they were growing up. I just look at their face and say, uh oh, I think we better talk. How's it go today? <laughs> well, I spend time in noon, they tell me, and I, I get them back up here again. <laughs> you know? And you've got to watch out for one another. See, this is why we come to church, watching out for one another, praying for one another. You, you understand that? You see? Say, th this is what we do. We, we, we look. How you doing, Mary? Mary, doing okay. Yeah. Missy, you okay back there? Yeah, good smile. Yeah, I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Look myself in the mirror. <laughs> I even look at myself and Bob, you need prayer. Susan, pray for me, baby. <laughs> Don't. Hesitate, pray one for another that you might be healed. See, we're, we're fighting a spiritual war here. There's people out here going to hell by the thousands. And this is why the church is here. This is why I'm teaching on, on, the, on, the, uh, on um, uh, sowing the seed. Okay, now. So you do a lot of sowing. You give out the tracks. Give out the tracks. We go to uh, anywhere. If you, you can track me down by my tracks. Yeah, Bob's been here, Susan's been here. Go in the bathroom, you'll see tracks. Go to Walmart, yeah, Bob's been here, you'll see tracks. People at Walmart know me. They hug Susan and me when we come in. We like this, to, yeah. We've we given them so many, I say, how do you hide a camel in the dust? I know, you camouflage him, you're right. <laughs> I mean, you have fun in this thing. It's literally fun. They'll get to know you. Yeah. And you pray for them, and, 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 and you'd be surprised how many Christians that you will meet and you can encourage in the Lord. Now, I'm going to say this because the time's running out fast. <clears throat> Today, I met an elderly gentleman. He was 78 years old. He's retired. And so I told him my Campbell joke, and I gave him his vitamins, and, and I said, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah. He said, let me give you my testimony. I said, I'd like to hear it. Now, we're in belt. Susan is sniffing out something over there anyway. Uh, <laughs> 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 
honey, you didn't, you didn't come into the store for that. You're looking for this over here. <laughs> I love my wife. <clears throat> so he said, you know, I was an alcoholic. And my wife was a Christian. And she prayed for me. I mean, she prayed for years for me. And finally, we made a, a uh, decision that uh, instead of me spending all the money on booze, that I would give her the money and she would pay the bills and all, but she would always give me some money for my booze. And so she would give me the money and she said, but I'm praying for you. Yeah, fine, give me the money. Anyway, he'd go to the liquor store and get his, get his little bottle and nip, nip it during the weekend, you know, and all. And, and so one day, uh, she gave him the money and he went to the liquor store. And he walked in, and the man says, you want usual? He, he said, want what? What, what you get, you usually get. Ah, I, I, don't, I, don't think, I, don't, I don't want that. He walked out. From that point on, he said, I never, I didn't want it. I didn't desire it. And I thought about that um, Scripture in uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Put it on the board. Um, how God can change our desires. Look at what the scripture says. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Not in your own strength, for it is God who is all the while effectively working in your husband, energizing and creating in your husband the power and the desire both to will and to, do, to, and, do, and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. So God takes that desire out and puts his desire in there. So you've got to get specific in that. Go ahead. One of the scriptures you gave Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of them. See, I keep putting those up there for you guys, you know. So you've got to understand what I keep putting scriptures is for you. For you to know, learn, mark it in your Bible, put it on the wall of the house. Plast it on the doorpost of your house. And then get to understand that God can change and give us power and energize us and create in you the power and the desire to do his will. You know, we can't do it on our own. You think you can. That, hu that human nature, the fallen nature is for itself. It's selfishness. Everybody understand that? Don't get, don't get mad at me. That's the same thing in me. If I let that thing have its way, it'll suck my spiritual life out totally gone. You got to put it off and put on that new man and say, God, if you don't do it in me, it won't get done. Oh, yeah, we can do the outside. We'll look like, you know, Jesus said, you whitewashed tombstones. You're, you're, you're white on the outside, but inside you as cold as a dead man. Come on, church, don't shout me down. Now I'm going to preaching. Oh, yeah, we just as holy on the outside. I don't do that. I don't do this. I don't do that. Inside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, God looks at the heart. I done dealt with too many folk in my day. I know it like the, I even know myself. If I let self have its way, I wouldn't be here tonight. <laughs> But I ain't going to let self have its way. I put it off. O-F what? <laughs> All right, thank you. O-F-F -F off. Look, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of this his good pleasure. So now you do it. It is a pleasure. What used to be a hard thing. Oh, you got to go to church tonight. Man, I worked all day. Listen, I know all about that. I worked out there, preached for 20 years and, and had an outside job. And every Wednesday night, I prayed for people every Sunday, all through the week, all those years. Six o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, seven days a week. All those years, Susan Mead did that. Because we let God do the work in it, it was pleasure. The Lord is my strength. When I walk in that door, they ain't, got, ain't nothing. I'm clean. God and me has already dealt with old Bob. 
And I walk in there, I'm a new man. Anybody love me here tonight? Yeah, yeah okay. You understand what I'm talking about? All right, now, this guy, he said, he said, he said you know, you, you could fill the bathtub up with liquor and put me in it, and I wouldn't drink a drop. God so worked in my heart, I hate it. Wow, I said, thank you for, I said, my father had the same experience when he received Christ as his personal savior. He quit like that and didn't touch another drop. And for years, he used to make moonshine back when he was a young boy, back in the 30s. So you got to realize that some of you, some folks are trying to change themselves. You're going down the wrong way. You put your faith in God. You remember that scripture, the promises of God. There's 8,810 promises in the word of God. You lay hold of that for it is God. It is God. It is God. You know why you're born again tonight? It is God. Yes. We owe our birth. St. John 1, 13, we owe our birth. Put that on the board. We owe our birth to who? God. To God. John, St. John 1, 13. We who owe their birth. Who, 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 that's us. We owe our birth neither to blood nor to the will of the flesh that is a physical impulse nor to the will of man that is a natural father, but we owe our birth to God. We have been born again by God. Yes. Hello? Yes. Do you realize why you're here tonight? Yes. God! Yes. God calls you to be born again. Yes. Man, if that don't excite you, I don't know what in the world can excite you. You'd be lost and go to a burning hell. But God birthed you into his kingdom. So we owe our birth to Bob Tilton. No. no. To who? God. And you owe your deliverance to God. If you're going to get deliverance, you're going to tap into God and say, God, you are able. You are more than able. You are more than able to deliver me from my own self. Because I know I go the way of the world. I tasted 26 years of the world. I thought I could drink all the liquor up, but I just, they just keep making it. And Willie was the same way. I mean, he was on one end of the ship drinking, and I'm on the other end drinking. It, listen, they make it by the truck loads. But there's nothing in me that wants it. You know why? Because God, yes. God did the work. Yes. I wouldn't drink a drop. Listen to me. I would not drink a drop of liquor for a million dollars. Put me to the test. Go ahead. Give me, put the million dollars out there. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. And I used to drink it all. If there's any in the house, I'd sniff it out. <laughs> Hello, are you out there? Yes. Now I'm going to preach it. <laughs> oh my God, the time's running now. Okay, let's, let's quit while we're, I had so much I wanted to share. Oh Lord, thank you Father, I give you praise and glory. I thank you Lord that our minds are made up. And we're going to just, just enjoy this week, enjoy you, Father, and share and, and, and give out tracts and, and, and talk about Jesus. Talk about the good things of God that the Lord has done. And we thank you for it now. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you if you need prayer.